Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Alice Billington. Uh, Alice is um, a social historian of medicine with particular interest in like, women, medical people, and their involvement with women's health broadly. I'm sure she'll give a, a better description of a lot of work than that. Um, she recently finished her PhD, her DPhil in Oxford, and I believe you're now writing up uh, that research for a commercial book, uh, but she's also working at the Hockham at the moment as a communications advisor. Anyway, her talk tonight is related to her research, Knowledge, Myth and Etiquette, Leaflet Campaigns and Puberty Education for Adolescent Girls, 1925 to 1966. So please welcome Alice. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and thank you, everybody, to coming for coming on Zoom and here. Um, <laughs> a 12-year-old girl in a bathroom in the 1920s, looking down and seeing a smudge of dull brown blood for the first time, was likely to have believed that she was in some way grievously injured or even dying. She was growing up at a time in Britain where frank and explicit explanations of menstruation to young girls were unusual and considered by some to be injurious to her status as a proper young woman. While navigating menstruation in her daily life, she might have been told to avoid washing her hair or her feet and to rest and enjoy, uh, avoid exercise. She was likely confused and embarrassed about what was happening to her body. A girl of the same age, in contrast, starting her period in the 1960s, would usually have been more informed. She might have read a colourful leaflet presented to her at school, sponsored by Tampax or Kotex. She might have had a conversation with her mother. She was growing up at a time where the absolute communication taboo about periods, which was characteristic of the early 20th century, was slowly beginning to lift. And information about her changing body was beginning to become available. The differences in experiences of these imagined girls in that confronting moment in which a spot of blood appears somewhere where it has not been before and throughout the rest of their lives as menstruating humans were, I argue, the result of decades of pioneering work by medical women. In this paper, I'm going to tell you about a specific group of medical women in Britain who began to research menstruation in the 1920s. They found that contrary to received medical wisdom, negative menstrual experiences were often socially constructed rather than innate. These women undertook significant research to prove their thesis that girls were only seen to be less capable post-puberty because of a lack of puberty education and access to facilities to manage their changing bodies, rather than because menstruation was fundamentally incapacitating. These women doctors set out on a decades long campaign to provide a new kind of puberty education and to improve menstrual infrastructure. I'm gonna start by giving you a really brief overview of my research as a whole, um, just to give you a little bit of context about where this paper fits in. My work revolves around the idea that throughout the 20th century, research and medical understandings of menstruation largely fell into two distinct categories narratives of menstrual capacity and narratives of menstrual incapacity. These narratives were influenced by the work of medical women, both as individuals and in groups, and their ideas are still enmeshed in 21st century Anglophone menstrual culture and practices. From PE teachers' eternal recommendations of a brisk walk to help with period pain, to conservative critiques of Clinton's presidential campaign, which suggested that women's hormones made them unfit to run a country. The viewpoints of the women doctors I study represent a binary in which menstruation could either be completely insignificant and irrelevant physiologically, or so catastrophically impactful that exams should be moved and criminal sentences lessened. And I don't have enough time to talk about that today, but possibly in a future paper. These binaries are still a prominent part of the way that we understand menstruation today. Arguments for menstrual and menopause leave reflect ideas about women needing special allowances to be made, alongside hormone balancing diets and recommendations to eat in line with your cycle, specific vitamins or supplements marketed towards the luteal phase, 
These attitudes represent a special treatment kind of menstrual understanding in which menstruating bodies have the potential to perform equally to non-menstruating bodies, but only with certain allowances. In contrast to this, there is the lean-in feminism kind of menstrual attitude in which menstruation is portrayed as so normal and so natural and unremarkable that it shouldn't influence life at all. In that model, menstrual or menopausal leave should not be required and cyclical changes in mood or experience are in irrelevance. The moment isolated in this paper is one of those first moments, is the first one of those moments. <laughs> Thinking in these kinds of binaries does not allow for the nuances of bodily experience either throughout 20th century menstrual research or today. Some middle ground between the two likely represented and still represents the experience of most menstruators. Catastrophic period pain, endometriosis and menorrhagia all cause menstruation to be a time which is far from manageable for some. While cyclical ebbs and flows and hormones have little to no effect on others. In my work, I endeavor to help shed a light on the history behind these perceptions, perhaps promoting, perhaps prompting questions about whose research they are based on why they are taken up by the media and what influences they may have on experiences of and perceptions of menstruation. I'm just going to give a little note on language and then we're going to properly get into the body of the talk. Um, so where I talk about women, uh, where I talk about specific actors in the past or groups of actors in the past, I intentionally use she, her pronouns so as not to ignore the fact that while gender and, and feminine uh, while gender and identity have always been complex, in this time, menstruation and femininity were intrinsically linked, and these actors should not have that reality ignored. However, in recognition of the fact that not everyone who menstruates identifies as a woman, and not all women menstruate, I endeavor to use gender neutral language in referring to people who menstruate in the present, or when I talk about menstruation more generally. I'm gonna start by talking about menstrual education dissemination in the early 20th century. Normal teaching about menstruation in the first decades of the 20th century was usually defined by its absence. One way I've interrogated this is through an analysis of 500 anonymous re responses to a 1996 mass observation directive on menstruation, which asked older women for descriptions of their menstrual experiences in the first half of the 20th century. Now, I've been told by some people who've read a first copy of this paper that in New Zealand, mass observation isn't as a familiar topic as it is in England. So suffice to say, it's a big survey. People are asked anonymously lots of questions. It's very interesting. Um, it's useful as a source in some ways as one element of an interrogation. Um, respondents who began menstruating in the 1920s and the 1930s reported complete ignorance of menstruation when their periods began, or very scant and patchy information passed on by friends. One writer stated that in her experience, it was barely spoken about. And when it was, a mother told an eldest daughter and the eldest daughter was expected to pass it on to her sisters when the time came. A woman who began menstruating in 1931 and wrote about her experience remembered, I thought I was dying, bleeding to death. She wrote that she had not been prepared in any way. It was so awful. Another woman who began menstruating at age 11 in 1927 spoke of the sheer horror she felt when she went to the bathroom and realized that she was bleeding. This respondent said that periods were discussed between her and her friends, but that most of our ideas were wronged and they had pieced together these ideas through little bits of information. A respondent who began menstruating slightly later in 1941 recalled standing screaming at the blood loss. She looked to her mother, but no explanation was forthcoming. These are not anomalies. They are characteristic of the way Menashe was described by the majority of hundreds of respondents to this directive who started puberty in the first half of the 20th century. In addition to this communication taboo, which created menstrual ignorance, there was an overarching medical framework of ideas surrounding menstruation as fundamentally incapacitating, physically, fundamentally incapacitating both physically and intellectually. And I'm going to share a very brief overview of some of these ideas. Rules about girls and what they could or should do with their bodies and minds, and when they were allowed to do them, continued to be tied up with medical theories about menstruation in dominant 19th and early 20th century medical thought. Girls were actively discouraged from pursuing education after puberty due to fears of racial suicide due to mass infertility 
the body was conceptualized as having a finite quantity of energy, which for women needed to be preserved above all else for the reproductive process. British physician Henry Maudsley's overtly political stance argued that as women's periodical functions established in concurrence with the time that education became more intellectually strenuous, their education would use up valuable energy and thus inhibit their reproductive functions. In Maudsley's widely accepted 1874 paper, Sex in Mind and Education, he stated that women were marked out by na in nature, women were marked out by nature for a very different office in life than men. This, Maudley, Maudsley claimed, was not the expression of prejudice or false sentiment. It was the plain statement of physiological fact. These late 19th century gynecological narratives conceptualized menstruation as a recurrent illness, which was a persistent drain on the physical and mental energies of women. This recurrent illness rhetoric continued in some circles until well into the 20th century impacting perceptions of what women and girls were allowed to do while menstruating and perceptions of what they were or were not physically and intellectually able to do after puberty. The male medical elite framed girls as delicate and unwell future mothers to be coddled and protected, which undermined women's fight to be treated as equals to men. Debunking these ideas was of particular interest for women in medicine as they had significant impact on perceptions of women's capacity to be educated as equals to men and to join the medical profession as their peers. There's so much more that I would like to say, but that will suffice for context. Um, now we'll turn to the women who endeavored to change these perceptions and experiences. The Medical Women's Federation was formed in 1917 out of several smaller associations for registered medical women. These groups and subsequently the Federation created a crucial new space for female professional and social interaction and development at a time when they were unable to join the kinds of organizations which provided this for male doctors. As the 20th century progressed, after the support women doctors provided in the war effort and, the par and partial enfranchisement in the UK, they gained slightly more cultural capital. They used this newfound authority to work together to fight for equal pay for women doctors ending the marriage bar and better rights for women workers, alongside forming committees on understudied elements of women's and children's health. The treatment of women's bodies by the formal medical profession, profession had previously largely be conceived as the treatment of biomedical symptoms, which represented a pathological condition. This meant that the frameworks of women's health, which were studied by doctors and used to treat or diagnose individual women patients, were usually framed in these terms, with a dearth of knowledge about what a normal or healthy women's bodily experience might be like. The Medical Women's Federation endeavoured to use their unique position as women within the formal medical profession to begin to change this, creating a series of committees to perform research into menstruation, women's cancers, breast and cervical, venereal diseases, birth control, abortion, pain and childbirth, maternal mortality, and the menopause. One of these committees, and the one that I'm focusing on this evening, set out to perform research in the form of two large surveys into normal adolescent menstruation, with the intention of furnishing the medical profession with an accurate clinical picture of what normal menstruation should be like. Normal adolescent menstruation was a topic which had been understudied by the wider medical community. This went that while many professionals and lay people had opinions on menstruation and its influences on adolescents by the 1920s, there had only been a few small studies. And there was no significant clinical picture from which to draw conclusions or make recommendations to schools and health boards. As adults with subjective experience of menage and the formal medical background to provide evidence to back up their ideas, these doctors were uniquely situated. They used their position to undertake research which helped generations of younger women reach their potential, but they also bolstered their own professional standing with this research. The Federation began their research into normal adolescent menstruation in the mid 1920s. And in short, they found that while menstruating, girls in school and at home were being prevented from taking part in their lives as normal. They were encouraged to lie down and read often prevented from taking part in even light exercise. The prevalence of belief in water myths also meant they were often prevented from taking warm baths or from getting their hair wet. 
The Federation's research showed that these common practices all appeared to be making girls' experiences of menstruation worse as gentle exercise and taking warm baths could alleviate a significant amount of menstrual discomfort. This seems like common knowledge now, but it was very novel at the time. And the Federation were often in hot water at conferences and letters pages of medical journals for suggesting that exercise and baths for menstruating girls might be helpful. The Federation also found that girls didn't know very much, if anything, about, their peri about managing their periods, disposing of used projects, products, or changing them frequently to prevent discomfort or leaking onto clothes, all of which made periods more uncomfortable and made girls more likely to miss school. They found that this was exacerbated by the fact that schools often didn't have bins or incinerators to dispose of used pads. They often didn't have locks on toilet doors or, and they didn't have adequate bathroom facilities. The Federation's research concluded that the conditions in which young girls began to menstruate were critical to their experiences and that new infrastructure and education was needed to enable girls to menstruate without shame and discomfort. Only then could older ideas about menstruation as fundamentally disabling be, at least partially, disproven. Federation surveys found that the narratives of incapacity which were prominent in the previous century did not appear to be due to menstruation being innately incapacitating or disabling, to use their words, as had previously been the leading medical thought. In fact, they found that for the majority of girls, menstruation was not accompanied with major pain or distressing symptoms of any kind. The Federation suggested that a universal menstrual incapacity was an inaccurate medical perception based only on study based on only studying pathological menstruation, based on prejudices, and based on a lack of education for young girls about what was happening to their bodies. Now I'm going to give you an outline of the menstrual education that the Federation endeavoured to provide. So they set out to change perspectives of menstruation via publishing in medical journals, working with governments to push schools to provide adequate facilities, and finally, the main topic of this paper, to create an education campaign. And what did that education look like? It looked like leaflets. And they don't look that exciting. Um, they really were incredibly novel. Though. In the 1920s, the Federation's leaflets were radical publications. They addressed specific concerns which were influencing menstrual distress and creating, which was re creating and reinforcing a cultural image of menstruation as inherently physically incapacitating. The Federation aimed to dispel myth and superstition and prevent outdated practices which were furthering ne negative menstrual experiences. They published four puberty education leaflets based on their research. This was a new method of transmitting puberty education. And it is interesting to note that the Federation thought it would be improper to even think about addressing the leaflets to the girls themselves until the 1950s. There's a lot to be said here about maternal authority and no time to say it in. Um, but I'm going to nod towards it. Um, the leaflets were redrafted roughly every decade in an attempt to keep their content up to date and in line with the needs of the girls at the time. And a brief analysis of their contents will furnish us with a better understanding of the way that the Federation curated this new method of menstrual education, which began at a time where simple written descriptions of what happens to bodies during menstruation was exceptionally novel. So this is the first leaflet, leaflet one. And it was into a climate that perceived menstruation as both incapacitating and improper to discuss that the Federation sent this first leaflet entitled Advice Regarding Menstruation to Parents, Schoolmistresses and Others in Charge of, of Girls, which is not an enormous thing. The leaflet contained basic professional advice to help educate those in charge of young girls about their changing bodies. And it was very brief, consisting of only a page of basic instructions for those in charge of adolescent girls. The leaflet began by describing menstruation as a natural function rather than an illness, setting the tone of the Federation's public menstrual education campaign. Their insistence that menstruation was normal and painless and a normal function of puberty became a consistent narrative throughout their publications, with almost all their leaflets and those published by brands and influenced by their research describing menstruation using this term, normal. In order to differentiate it from older ideas that menstruation was an illness or a disability of some kind. This was the kind of modern menstruation represented by health and vitality, which the Federation identified in their research and promoted through their educational leaflet campaign. This 1925 leaflet contained instructions about washing as normal, 
stating that there was no risk to taking a bath at this time. And there was no risk to allowing a girl to take part in normal gymnastics and games, both of which were suggested as remedies for mild pain and discomfort. It was, however, suggested that long expeditions or bike rides and any competitive exercise which might encourage girls to exhaust their reserves of strength should be indulged in with caution. This suggested a level of caution within the Federation around recommending any kind of vigorous exercise. It's really also important and interesting to note that they don't talk anything about the biological function of menstruation. There's no conversation about bleeding, about bodies, about what a period is. Um, it's really just behavioral, behavioral management. Um, it's simple in structure and message, but it did succeed as a method of transmitting basic information that dispelled common myths. It provided clear and simple information in order to attempt to prevent these myths from exacerbating perceptions of menstrual capacity. Um, and then we're gonna move on to leaflet two, which is still quite plain and relatively terse. Um, it's got a little star though, so that's like maybe slightly jazzier, but still not enormously exciting. Um, the Federation's second leaflet was entitled The Health of Adolescent Girls. So at least they had a shorter title this time. Um, and it was published at some time between 1937 and 1940. Um, I'm not quite sure of the time, but I know that during those years, they were in a different office because their first office was bombed. So, um, and the address of the second office is on the back of the leaflet. Um, it was a redraft of the first leaflet. Uh, it was published after a menstrual leaflet committee was created to redraft the first leaflet. The committee consisted of six women doctors who represented both the old and new faces of the Medical Women's Federation. Catherine Chisholm was 61, Letitia Fairfield was 57, Doris Odlum was 47, Mona McNaughton 43, Anis Gilly 37 and Karen Parks was 33. And the differences between Catherine Chisholm's medical education and career, which began in 1898 when she was the first medical student at Owens College in Manchester, and that of Karen Parks, who graduated from King's College London in 1929, which at that point had been accepting women medical students for nearly 15 years, were vast. Chisholm's journey to medicine began in the Victorian period, just at a time when women represented a tiny fraction of British doctors, and women doctors had to fight to be respected and accepted in their choice of career. In contrast, Parks began medical school after women, the women's partial enfranchisement and the successes of medical women during the war at a time where women's role in medicine was starting to solidify. A marked generational conflict began to arise between the first generations of women doctors and those coming up behind them, marked by the gradually increasing standing of women in the medical profession. The older doctors of the Federation were used to their role as women in medicine being so radical that they had to maintain a level of conservatism in their work, whereas doctors qualifying later in the period into a professional climate which had seen women doctors thrive during the war and beyond were able to slightly push those boundaries because of their increased security and cultural capital. In the committee meeting notes from 1937, the Federation discussed the idea of addressing a leaflet to the girls themselves to be presented to them before the onset of menstruation, but the committee agreed unanimously that it would not be possible to create a suitable leaflet of this kind. The committee doctor's reticence to even consider writing a leaflet designed to be given to prepubescent girls demonstrated a reluctance within the committee to speak directly to menstruating girls rather than their mothers, reflecting Edwardian attitudes about menstrual education and maternal authority present at the Federation's foundation. By the late 1930s, attitudes were changing, even within the Federation, but there was still a solid foundation of more conservative doctors making crucial decisions within the Menstrual Leaflets Committee. Now onto the content of this leaflet. The Health of Adolescent Girls was slightly more comprehensive than the Federation's previous publication. It comprised two pages rather than one, and the information was split into five key points pertaining to what the Federation referred to as the basics of menstrual education. Again, nothing about the function of menstruation or what it was like to menstruate, um, mostly behavioral. The leaflet began by explaining that menstruation was an easy, natural function and instructing that a daily warm bath should be taken as usual, with caution that there was no justification to the old idea which still survives that washing is harmful at this time. This demonstrated that, as in 1925, the Federation was still concerned that adherence to water myths was causing unnecessarily menstrual discomfort in adolescents. 
The Federation then recommended that taking exercise daily would relieve pain, including games, dancing and freestanding exercises, although caution was again given regarding taking part in matches or competitions. An emphasis was placed on paying careful attention to avoid chafing by using suitable towels and ensuring that they were changed regularly. There was no description of what kind of towel might be considered suitable, highlighting the fact that in this period, there was a transition between reusable homemade pads and new disposable pads. The leaflet also cautioned the adult reader to ensure that their charger's clothes were so designed that the girl can, without self-consciousness, take part in their usual activities. This recommendation highlighted the way that young girls and those in charge of them were being implicitly taught that concealment while menstruating was critical. This inclusion reinforced the idea that visible suggestions of menstruation were something that should be concealed. And, this, and that this emphasis on the etiquette of concealment was coming from a group of doctors lent a professional credibility to the notion. In the case of this leaflet's advice, the bulky reusable or disposable towels of the time attached to a belt around the waist would protrude, especially on particularly slender or very young girls, which was likely why caution was advised in choosing clothes so as to conceal this bulge. New fashions, which were cut more closely to the body with shorter hemlines, undoubtedly contributed to these concerns. While it made sense to implore the careful concealment of menstruation at a time where girls' bodies were a sight so fraught with debate, reinforcing these ideas about hiding periods introduced new ideas of shame and objection rather than working to contradict them. The Federation was facilitating a new kind of menstrual education and promoting the implementation of a menstrual infrastructure while still underlining the idea of menstruation as a private and somewhat distasteful topic. This reinforced specific menstrual etiquette practices formed with the experiences and attitudes of a previous generation in mind. This meant that this kind of education may have imbued adolescent girls with attitudes to menstruation which were becoming out of date. So now we have the third leaflet, which is not gonna be shocking, it's pretty beige. Um, <laughs> the next, Federation leaflet entitled Advice on the Monthly Period was the final Medical Women's Federation menstrual education leaflet to actually be printed and distributed. They produced this leaflet in the mid-1950s in conjunction with the Family Doctor, which was a monthly journal put out by the British Medical Association. The BMA was an organisation which represented the medico-political needs of the wider medical community and was responsible for the publication of the British Medical Journal. Women were not allowed to join its ranks until the final decades of the 19th, 19th century, but by the first decades of the 20th century, the BMA had begun to campaign for the needs and the rights of both medical women and medical men. As women gained standing within the profession, younger generations of women, uh, of med of women doctors no longer desperately needed the kind of separate female professional culture provided by the Medical Women's Federation. These younger doctors began to seek organisations which would ignore the differences between them and their male colleagues rather than centralising them. The crucial difference between this leaflet and the previous two was that the version created in conjunction with the family doctor was in the second person, which made it the first leaflet written by or with the Federation that was addressed specifically to the adolescent girl rather than to her mother or a teacher in charge of her. This illustrates a move away from the original leaflet format, likely due to the outside influence of the younger generation of women doctors involved in the British Medical Association and the family doctor. Addressing the girls themselves aligned with the kind of child-centered education which was becoming popular in the middle of the 20th century. This shows a shift away from the Federation's, from the Federation's leaflets committee in terms of relevance, as younger women doctors appear to have had more scope to align themselves with more modern techniques and ideas without fear of delegitimizing their entire profession by being perceived as too radical. While advice on the monthly periods was the same length as the 1930s leaflet, its content was significantly altered. It began with a scientific explanation of the exact function of menstruation, describing in direct terms the fact that every normal woman experiences blood coming away from the front passage on a monthly basis. There was, for the first time, an explanation of the menstrual blood as the lining of the womb shedding in preparation to reform and prepare for child rearing. This language was euphemistic and vague, but still much more descriptive than the previous leaflets, which focused more on dispelling myths about menstrual behaviour rather than explaining the biological functions of a menstrual period. This implicit reference to the sex 
and the function that menstruation played in reproduction aligned with changing post-war ideas about the proprietary of sex education. The other novelty of the sleeplet was that there was more of a practical focus on which kinds of products to use rather than just the advice to use suitable products. With a section on how to select appropriate towels, how best to use them and how to dispose of the different types correctly, which reflected the accessibility and popularity of disposable products rather than reusable by this point in the century. This information about products was frank and helpful with only a slight nod to the disapproval the Federation felt towards what they called old fashioned reusable pads. Yet, for all this departure from previous practice, advice on the monthly periods placed a particularly heavy focus on concealment. In fact, to a far greater extent than the previous leaflets, specifically noting that the care girls were being taught to have for their bodies was for the comfort of others. The girls the leaflet was addressed to were encouraged to make sure they disposed of their pads without unpleasantness to others, to wash thoroughly morning and evening, not to relieve pain, but to avoid an unpleasant stale smell, to change pads frequently to avoid an unpleasant smell to those around you and to avoid swimming again for the comfort of others. This theme reinforced ideas about uncleanliness and about menstruation as something private and dirty, which was at odds with the picture of active and capable menstruation that the Federation seemed to be trying to curate. This reflects the continuance of Edwardian ideas about modesty within these leaflets. The dismissal of water and exercise myths were also mentioned briefly, with the reassurance that bathing does no harm and an assertion that the usual sports and exercise are a benefit to you and the practice of going to bed for a day or two should be discouraged. Far less priority was placed on the dismissal of myth than in previous publications, demonstrating the way that these ideas were becoming common knowledge by the 1950s. The focus of the content of the leaflets was shifting to encompass different issues because there were now more girls in schools, new products to give advice on, and the data from a new survey from the Federation about product disposal to share. So, to move on to the final leaflet, which as you can see, isn't a leaflet, it's just a drawing, but it's a very cool drawing. Um, and I think the jazziest of all. Um, one final leaflet was written by the Federation in the early 1960s, but was never published. This leaflet was to be entitled Signpost to Womanhood. It was intended to be the next edition of their series of menstrual education leaflets. However, despite more than three years of work, it was never disseminated because of a drop in demand. It was proposed to the family doctor in July of 1963, approaching the 40 year anniversary of the first leaflet with the intention of bringing the content up to date. The proposal was accepted and the family doctor agreed to destroy all of their previous stock and begin distributing this new leaflet as soon as it was completed. The archives that I consulted contained several heavily annotated drafts of the leaflet's proposed content written by three different doctors and a huge amount of letters back and forth describing the reasons that these inclusions were or were not necessary, making things put back in and then taken back out again. Um, chaos. <laughs> After significant internal disagreements, the leaflet's text was finally completed and agreed upon and sent to the family doctor in July of 1965. The family doctor representative replied three weeks later, apologizing for the tardiness of their response and explaining that since 1963, there had been a significant drop in leaflet sales and an increase in printing and postage costs, which made the leaflets really no longer possible. A sales record was included with this letter showing that takings for the leaflet had dropped by nearly 20 pounds between 1961 and 1965. And a spokesperson from the family doctor highlighted that the way the Federation was circulating their leaflets was one of the key issues. The cost of writing to schools to inform them of the leaflets was out of all proportion to the income that they may obtain. This suggests that not only were the kinds of menstrual education the Federation were providing falling out of favor, their methods of distribution were also. Negotiations appear to have gone on for over a year with a lot of desperate letters and the final letter on the topic from the family doctor was received in the summer of 1966. This letter was very strongly worded. It explained that there was no longer any, in capitals, demand for the Federation's leaflets as plenty of brands now made adequate leaflets and that would it be in the Federation's best interest for this activity to be brought to an end. The issues which the wider Federation were grappling with and struggling to agree upon in, with respect to the content, language and tone of their final leaflet caused delays which ultimately meant that signposts to womanhood would never go into circulation 
these debates highlighted the way that some of the members of the Federation continued to maintain perceptions of and teaching around menstruation, which remained firmly situated in early 20th century thinking, and highlighted the issues of generational difference between the early Federation doctors and their younger colleagues, and the young women doctors who joined the BMA. In discussing these leaflets, I hope to have shown how the Federation continued to put forward a specific model of menstrual education, which was radical at the start of their campaign, but almost obsolete by the 1960s, when they began to be surpassed by other organizations who were not rooted in the conservatism inherent to the precarity experienced by early women doctors. I'm now just gonna briefly talk about the way that branded leaflets rose to the challenge of catering to this new kind of adolescent girl, to a new kind of adolescent girl. My wider research into this examines the ways that narratives surrounding menstruation shifted from the vitality and capacity present in the Federation's literature to menstruation as a problem, which menstrual management products needed to solve. As the popularity of commercial menstrual management products rapidly expanded, the brands which produced these products began, uh, became the go-to experts for menstrual education. The commodification of menstruation and its various management products led to this change in authority, spurred on by the Federation leaflets failing to move with the times and the rapid and fundamental shifts in the lifestyles of young girls from the 1950s. Menstrual education was no longer being exclusively produced by well-meaning groups of female doctors fastidiously publishing simple and plain leaflets, which provided information drawn from research and was mailed out to, were mailed out to schools. This kind of education was now also provided by brands who produced period products and used leaflets and pamphlets as thinly veiled advertising, distributing them widely at low or no cost. These new leaflets were designed to appeal to a new generation of young female consumer, a girl who was somewhat distanced from her mother in the home and felt that she should be addressed as a person and a consumer in her own right. While in the 1920s, frank advice about how to educate their daughters on the topic of menstruation given to mothers was a radical novelty, by the early 1960s, girls increasingly expected to be treated as individuals. Promoting specific menstrual management products as the solution to all menstrual problems to young girls on the brink of puberty could create a lifelong customer for Boots, Silcot, Kotex, or Feminex. This is because with personal products, personal hygiene products as they're called, alongside other products that people are less likely to discuss and compare experiences with others about throughout their lives, it's often the case that once a customer always a customer. Menstrual product brands began using this information to produce advertising material in the form of menstrual education leaflets. And these leaflets conceptualized menstruation as a hygienic crisis. These leaflets drew significant influence from the leaflets published in the first half of the century by the Federation, often cribbing whole sections word for word. Despite appearing similar in content on the surface, the intentions behind these publications differed significantly which likely had an effect on the girls who were being taught about their bodies in this way. As this paper has demonstrated, the Federation's leaflets aim to cut through a climate of silence and myth and furnish adolescents, via their mothers at first, with accurate and measured information about managing periods based on research. Their intentions were to improve menstrual experiences by solving the problems caused by silence and myth surrounding menstruation and thus promoting a new narrative of menstrual capacity. In contrast, these new leaflets, created in conjunction with menstrual management products, were devised with the intention of selling a product. While the Federation framed mild menstrual discomfort or unhappiness as a problem caused by a lack of knowledge which could be solved by spreading accurate information, these companies conceived of menstruation as a problem within itself, which could only be solved by whatever product they were promoting. These products sold shame and modernity hand in hand. These product leaflets sold shame and modernity hand in hand and promoted a new kind of menstrual culture as acquired through purchasing products to prevent the shame or embarrassment, which they framed as inherent to menstruating. This new kind of leaflet built upon the recommendation for correct menstrual behavior as represented by the Federation, such as the denigration of reusable pads, the enforcement of menstrual etiquette, and the repetition of the idea that menstruation should be normal and painless, and use these ideas to create a narrative that their product alone would allow for that correct menstrual behavior. The way that brands have used shame, feminine ideals, and constructions of menstruation as a hygienic crisis to sell their products via adverts throughout the second half of the 20th century and now into the 21st century has been the topic of significant research 
my research links the beginning of this kind of problem solving menstrual product advertising with the end of the Federation's leaflet campaign and the overlapping content of these different forms of menstrual education leaflets. It's impossible to conclude. It's impossible to analyze the direct impact of the Medical Women's Federation leaflets on individual adolescents. Yet, the evidence of their wide sales, the ways in which by the 1960s, responses to proposals for a new leaflet were met with incredulity on the grounds that what was covered was common knowledge, suggests that they succeeded in facilitating knowledge transmission and providing a step in the right direction towards combating deeply entrenched communication taboos and myth-based beliefs. However, as the needs of adolescent girls changed, the Federation leaflets changed, failed to change fast enough, and their final leaflet, which was the most modern and overt in its content, caused significant internal conflict, which ultimately took up so much time that the decline in demand for such leaflets became apparent to their publishers. Part of this decreased need was due to a new kind of product-based leaflet produced by brands from the mid-1940s onwards, which were significantly more accessible, attractive, and had color printed images. They were designed to be read by the girls and they represented a new kind of modern menstruation, which was appealing to their audience. These new branded leaflets represented a shift away from the Federation's constructive constructions of menstruation as normal and natural and towards menstruation as a problem which needed to be fixed by specific consumer products. Um, is the end of my talk. Um, Questions? Uh, Alice, who, who were the, the men, the males, in some of those early uh, group shots? Here? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so often they, so the whole purpose of the Federation at the start was to create a kind of social space for women doctors. And so they would come together to present papers and research, and then they'd dress for dinner and go in a carriage for a sumptuous dinner, is like the way they described it. Um, and in order to gain legitimacy, they would also invite male doctors to come and present papers and present their research to facilitate a space where women, the women doctors could listen to that research um, when they couldn't go to the open lectures held by, say, the BMA at the time. Presumably there would have been some reservation in having males involved at all. Yes, but I think the, because the main idea was that they wanted to provide this intellectual space, they felt that allowing men to, they were, the men weren't members, they were just allowed to come and speak and I think the times that photographs were taken were maybe when more prestigious men came to speak because there were very few photos of the early federation. Yeah. Um. You might comment on the fact that um, we still have adverts where blood is blue. Yeah, I absolutely would. Um, so a really wonderful historian that I know relatively well called Camilla Rosvick is she's an art historian and she's currently working on that um, and basically I was actually talking to my colleague Cherry about this earlier showing period blood or blood at all was completely forbidden in advertising so using the blue liquid was a workaround that was actually quite novel because it meant that periods could kind of be talked about and shown so right at the start it was kind of empowering and novel and then now we've got to a point where it's just so ridiculous and sanitized that that's still what we're using um well, like, that's slime now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, as a male I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Do you, have you ever watched the television? Oh, so, okay, so if you watch a, an advert for tampons or pads on the television, or I guess before a YouTube video now, um, usually they'll show the pad and it's kind of, it's in the shape as though it's on a woman, but there's no woman there. It's just kind of, it's femininely shaped. <laughs> um, as they would probably describe it. And then they show blue liquid dropping into it to demonstrate absorbency in, in the place oh, of blood, oh. um, which is a really strange and sanitised way of representing menstruation. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent does the research cover the different attitudes within the past? Because it seems to me that that covers the, there's yeah. a huge range there, particularly also in terms of things like sanitation and... Definitely. Education. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Thank you so much. So my wider research focuses a lot more on class. I had to cut so much out to kind of condense it into this one hour that I haven't really touched on it. But there were actually, a, because 
about what I want to say. Because all of the women doctors at the start of the period were wealthy, kind of upper middle class, in order to have gained the education and the support to be able to get into medicine, they often had very, um, like, quite eugenic and unpleasant ideas about class. And those ideas bled through, for want of a better term, into their research into menstruation, specifically at the start of the period. So there's one doctor, Alice Anderson Clow, who I study, who did all of her research um, into Cheltenham Ladies College girls, um, and then created this narrative about menstruation based entirely on Cheltenham Ladies College girls. And within that narrative, she published widely about the fact that um, poor women didn't experience menstrual pain, and only wealthy women experienced menstrual pain. Um, and then she based a lot of her work on that. And she got that from the idea that the poor women that she came across never took time off when they were menstruating, but all the wealthy women she knew were encouraged to take time off. Um, and she kind of extrapolated from there that it, it was experienced differently rather than there may be finan financial ramifications to taking time off <laughs> if you're working <laughs> kind of hand to mouth. So there's definitely some class implications throughout this research. The Federation um, made a much more concerted effort to think about class more broadly. So this this big survey that they did, they looked all the way from kind of charitable institutions and orphanages all the way up to private schools, um, and they found um, that the provisions for the poorer girls were much, much worse, and they put a lot of work into trying to provide better facilities for those girls. Um, but yeah, th it's a really good question, and it's, a, it's definitely something to keep thinking about. Thank you. Uh, that was a very really interesting thank you. thank you. Just following on from that question was given to class thing. Do you know where the leaflets were distributed to? Yeah. And sort of how widely throughout England? Yeah, so um, I've got a record of all of the leaflets. Thankfully, the Federation, as a group of women, they were aware that people weren't recording what they were doing, so they employed an archivist almost immediately as soon as they started. So they've got really rigorous archives, which is amazing as a researcher and now as someone who works in an archive. Um, and uh, so we've got records of where all of them were sent. And basically what they did is they had like a, a blanket letter that they sent to every school they could think of or find in England and then and then sent them out to schools. And also um, they had like an address on the back so people would often, and I've got a lot of copies of letters where people wrote to the Federation and asked for leaflets to distribute. Um, yeah. I think there's a question right up at the top. I don't need the microphone. <laughs> Hi, um, I often think of, obviously that was a really, really interesting talk. That was awesome and I covered so many cool things about stuff that I didn't know you. Um, I often think of New Zealand as being at least 15 or 20 years behind the rest of the world on a lot of topics. Um, and did um, your research touch on what the distribution of these leaflets was like in New Zealand? Were we using the same leaflets or were we still not saying in the 40s or anything like that? Yeah, so that's a really good question and that's kind of where my research is heading now. So I actually only moved here relatively recently, so my research kind of predominantly focuses on the UK. However, I did find a big cache of letters that I kind of set to one side that were the Federation doctors writing to people who were po posted as think sort of like medical missionaries um, in South Africa and in New Zealand talking about their experiences um, with the girls that they were treating and talking to and how kind of backwards their menstrual habits were and asking for leaflets to distribute to the girls so that's definitely a path I would really like to start exploring um, yeah especially now that I'm here and I'm learning so much about New Zealand history I'm like oh my gosh I want to blend it all together um, yeah but thank you that was a great question I can speak loudly, it's okay. Um, I, just, I just wanted to comment, I was interested to see a um, like reference there to pain in menstruation and sort of the, the advice to go and sort of seek medical um, opinion if, if, if pain was sort of at an unusual level. But I guess I'm thinking now about sort of education around endometriosis and how there's still such such kind of lack of knowledge around these sorts of issues and, and, and like... Is there any 
I guess like how advanced was the understanding, the actual medical understanding at that time about how to help and support people who had, you know, intense pain during their periods? Yeah, so that's a really great question and it's a really difficult one to answer. Um, there was a lot of focus on kind of problematic menstruation at the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century and the way that medical doctors would always intervene surgically. So it was 90% men and they would have very young women and they would do very intensive surgical interventions um, to try and alleviate menstrual discomfort and pain, um, often with much worse effects. So the kind of radical nature of the Federation saying periods should be normal and not painful and you can just have a warm bath and go for a walk sounds like it's kind of erasing those experiences of pain. However, for the time, it was actually quite radical. The notion that it didn't need to be like a, a blind surgical intervention for every case of period pain. Um, and then as we move, so the, the Federation had this like very intense view that periods were normal and manageable and kind of erased in a lot of ways quite severe menstrual pain and discomfort and and endometriosis and like that kind of thing because they were so set on trying to disprove the fact that menstruation was incapacitating fundamentally but as their research progressed and coming into the 50s and 60s they start to kind of acknowledge that there's more nuance to that um, that's not a binary between menstruation being fundamentally incapacitating or fundamentally not <laughs> um, but there's definitely it's difficult because narratives which prioritise the fact that menstruation can be incapacitating tend to delegitimise women's authority or people's authority. And in contrast, narratives that do the opposite tend to delegitimise people who have really painful or awful periods. So it's kind of a, a lose-lose. <laughs> or a win-win. But, yeah. Just a comment. When I was a medical student in Edinburgh in 1965, do our ONG males were segregated from the females. That doesn't surprise me. We had, um, but we had 30% women in, yeah. our, in our class. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That that kind of aligns with, with everything I've heard. Mm. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah. Like, in our it's so interesting. No, it's so interesting. And it's so recent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we're still at a point where menstruation is still perceived in so many ways to be disgusting or... Um, incapacitating in some way, so there's still so much work to be done. Oh, I think there was one more. Can I just oh, ask yes. another, which partly just follows that. What happened when there were no, when you, you know, when there were no women doctors? Did, it, did this get covered at all? Do you mean kind of prior to? No, really more at the time because depending on, yeah. you know, how many, I mean, How so many doctors. Yeah, it's, there, it's right? a, it's a, there was about a thousand ish during sort of, yeah, 1930 to 1950, there was about a thousand and then progressing through there. Um, and the thing is that because the archives that I look at are the Medical Women's Federation archives, I don't know what was happening where there weren't any women because there was nobody archiving it. Um, but I'm going to assume that it was leaning more on the ideas that were coming from the previous century. However, the Federation were making a really concerted effort to present at conferences. They presented at the um, Obstetrics and Gynecology Conference every year with this data. They were publishing articles in the British Medical Journal. They were making sure that these ideas were being disseminated, not just to adolescent girls and their mothers, but also to the wider medical community. I assume in the hope that male doctors would then see it in the BMJ and ha see that it had some legitimacy or authority and it might kind of flow through to their treatment. Question? No more questions. Please join me in thanking Alice for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>